Maybe let's get to Ziada. Ziada, can you tell us what's happening on the ground? In Because, I mean, we are more policymakers here and regulators. Uh, so, Ziada, do you want to tell yes, us yeah, uh, what's happening on the ground there? Uh, thank you, Prof. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ziada Zalwango from Uganda. And... Um, just to share a bit of our experience here back at home, I've been uh, listening intently to the presentations that have been made today, and I could say that we more or less do face the same challenges when it comes to uh, ensuring effective uh, regulation of our supply chains. But one of the, um, I think it's going to be in terms of a question, but also as I'm also talking about what's happening in the Ugandan situation, uh, as a result of the pandemic, one of the areas where we can say in Uganda, we had um, a major, should I say, positive step forth as there was increased engagement and collaboration between the different industry regulators. Because uh, for the case of Uganda, we reached a point whereby we definitely realized that we couldn't just continue relying on donations from um, you know, other countries to be able to fill the gap within uh, uh, the COVID-19 healthcare commodities as a result of the increase in demand. So the government did um, advocate during the pandemic up to date, the government has been largely advocating for import substitution support for, for the local manufacturing industry, which, so, which has seen quite a number of factories within the local market uh, coming up and uh, investing in alternative production lines so that they can be able to uh, supplement supply of, of, of COVID-19 PPEs. However, um, to because as, as, as part of, of, of uh, supporting uh, industry investment, local industry investment, we saw part of the stimulus package going to particular industries. So as, as um, practitioners, healthcare practitioners in this particular case, as a pharmaceutical society of Uganda, to which, on which I sit as a committee member, we went through a lot of um, information sharing with different industry regulators as to why the healthcare sector, especially the pharmaceutical manufacturing sector, had to be prioritized as amongst um, factories that are going to be receiving stimulus package that they can actually support um, uh, manufacture of some of these PPEs. However, the, the, the positive step I'm talking about that we had here is for so long uh, in Uganda, the National Drug Authority, which has the mandate of, of um, regulating uh, uh, safe and effective medicines on the market has been working um, in, 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 in silo. And yet we have other regulators. For example, we have the Uganda National Bureau of Standards. Now the Uganda National Bureau of Standards usually does a lot of regulations of most of the other industries and outside the healthcare sector. However, there will be, there will be uh, areas where NDA had to come, needed to come in, but was being ousted. For example, areas to do with uh, some foods and beverages that we have on the market. Um, areas to do with, for example, during COVID, we saw uh, factories such as uh, the textile industries, we saw factories in the alcohol-based um, sector taking on manufacture of hand sanitizers, taking on manufacture of masks. But these are not areas that are originally mandated to be supervised by the National Drug Authority. This is now the Uganda National Bureau of Standards that is supervising these factories. So there was need for increased engagement between the authority and the Bureau of Standards to say, look, these are the guidelines. Uh, if, if these factories are going to be man coming on board to start manufacturing these products, we need to be involved because we have the guidelines, we have expectations on how um, their manufacturing process should go if they're going to be pro producing products for human consumption or for, for, for healthcare use. So we, we saw increased engagement between NDA, between uh, Uganda National Bureau of Standards, between the Uganda Revenue Authority, because we're seeing now so many importers that we're bringing in healthcare related commodities, for example, masks, uh, but bringing them and they don't want to declare them at the port of entry as pharmaceutical products. Because once you declare this is a pharmaceutical product, it is actually, has to, you have to be verified by the National Drug Authority. They have to verify your supplier. They have to take you through a series of processes to see 
uh, to the effectiveness of the product you're bringing into the country? Are you a registered distributor? So there were quite a number of, of um, people that were bypassing that process. So there was a need for increased engagement of the revenue authorities that look, people need to go through this process. Don't declare, people shouldn't be allowed to declare anything, especially PPEs as textiles, as furniture, as stationery. It has to be declared as pharmaceutical products to increase on the vetting of these products as they're coming into the country. And um, as much as we saw increased engagement in that area, we are not yet, uh, we are yet to see if we shall have continued uh, harmonization of these processes moving forward. Because earlier I had shared in the chat box that one thing we have noticed, which is really limiting different industry regulators to come together and harmonize the activities, is we've gotten to appreciate over time, most of these interventions are paid for by either the manufacturers, if, if you're going to, you know, if NDA is going to come to the manufacturer to do um, uh, an operation based on trying to assess your quality systems, you have to pay, it's, you have, there are annual fees that are paid. And the same goes to other different regulators. So I think there is hesitancy in case that these um, interventions are harmonized. Some regulators fear they're going to be losing out on income, which they are actually getting from the different either factories or maybe um, uh, manufacturers or the local technical representatives of different products. So there's that kind of unwillingness because it does reduce on their resource base. That's what we have learned over time. But that's what is currently happening in Uganda. Um, as a society, as pharmaceutical society of Uganda during COVID, we also utilize the scarcity in, in uh, for example, hand sanitizers. And as a society, we're actually, as I speak, we are in the, we, we did start um, manufacturing in the hand sanitizers, more so because we failed to identify quality hand sanitizers on the market. There was increased demand, especially by the government. So we came in as a society and we supported that cause. And we, we did a lot of supporting of, uh, the national and the regional fire hospitals to start this kind of local manufacturing units within their premises, but also mm -hmm. as a setting up a, a production and a laboratory analysis unit, because we still have a very big gap when it comes to issues of pharmaceutical product analysis. And uh, most of the time we find that the National Drug Authority is actually looking for people to outsource to, because they are extremely overwhelmed and there's no one to outsource this this work to So as a society, we're setting up a unit, it's still under construction. And um, I know South Africa is very, at least you're more invested in some of these areas than we are as a country. And hopefully I'm looking forward to having increased interactions around issues of, of you know, the analytical processes that, you know, are going into increasing or strengthening the regulation of, of supplies with fever. Okay, uh, so yeah, so that's pretty creative. I, I, yeah, I, I know that maybe Margaret can comment on this. I know that before COVID, there was typhoid in Zimbabwe, and the University of Zimbabwe started making hand sanitizer. Are you are you still making hand sanitizer, Margaret? Yes, 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 we are. Um, yes, because actually, when the pandemic started and with the lockdowns, that's when they scaled up the production. So there's a mini production unit that has been supplying actually to um, Net Farm. Yeah, but the production is still going on. Okay, that's good. And then I'm um, just before maybe I, I move on to the next speaker. Uh, Margaret, what are the gaps in Zimbabwe? So uh, that's what I think is as regulators as you know, policymakers, what are the gaps that you see? Okay, the moment I'll pick out um, maybe the stringent analytical uh, part, like really looking at the products and not just verifying that the active is there, but also what is happening to the product. Is, are there any, um, any other substances, there any toxic substances, any um, degradants in the product? So I would say that is the major gap in terms of um, giving it like a scientific approach of really assessing these products. And okay. MCZ does spot, sort of like spot check sometimes, but I think um, it's something There's that- There's still capacity, the same thing that Dr. Zalwango is talking about. There's still yes. lack of capacity. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, Randall, you're the numbers guy. 
how can we use technology to you know in the fight against counterfeits i guess the uh, i'm sorry uh, maybe, maybe just man. introduce yourself to, to to you know to colleagues here and then you can get into it perfect um is my audio coming through okay yes it is oh, as perfect. usual <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Randall. I work for Clarivate Analytics, or so now Clarivate, the science group. And, um, you know, as a company, we provide information and data to about 7,000 companies, government institutions, universities, and corporates around the world. And we cover everything from um, the IP side of it, and we track products all the way through to in-market and payer provider information. And last year was, was, um, was a year of of um, on the one hand in the Northern Hemisphere in particular, a huge uptake in utilizing data um, for decision-making and for ensuring that uh, we don't run into shortages. So um, just in terms of, of what we'd seen, and I think what I'll do is I'll actually move towards the, the example of antibiotics because antibiotics is always a, a major issue and it's something that's really easy to track. Um, but one of the big things is always trying to make sure that you have a robust, um, a robust supply chain. It's a little bit difficult in, in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa in particular because of the lack of, of API manufacturers and even raw material manufacturers and excipient manufacturers, uh, which is something that we've been uh, monitoring for a long time. And we've actually just recently developed a, a new platform called Supply Chain Management, which would allow... Uh, companies to request quotes from uh, verified companies directly, even governments. And when we start to look at um, the regulations, for uh, as an example, um, the FDA has led the charge there from um, the night uh, from 30 December 2019 up until um, the 3rd of May. So this Monday past. Uh, regulations related or regulatory changes related to COVID-19 amounted to about, uh, or globally they amounted to about 3,900. And the FDA basically led with close to about 30% of those regulations. So being active in that space is highly important because um, so many companies and so many people rely on on, um, the regulators to really drive the charge and drive um, innovation, because if you really think about it, the regulators is the th- that's where the innovation really comes from. When regulators start to drive, um, drive and incentivize quality in particular. I mean, even in the US, the FDA, um, ten point five percent of all of the shortages, drug shortages, have been antibiotics. And from two thousand one to twenty thirteen, there were one hundred and forty eight antibiotic drug shortages across the country. Someone mentioned ivermectin. Oh, sorry, uh, there was a, uh, a, a little uh, image I saw of ivermectin in one of the presentations. Um, interestingly, South America in Brazil, there were 222 million um, doses that were provided of one brand of generic um, ivermectin VMC. Um, so when we start to look in, into these kinds of pieces of information, we can immediately start to pick out ways that we can, we can really start to understand where, where these gaps may be. Moving into the area of antibiotics, if we're just looking at antibiotic manufacturers globally, there were 1,200 manufacturers, and about 550 of those are only focusing on their local markets. They're not exporting at all. And only 182 of those can export into the highly regulated markets like um, the US, the EU, and Japan. And currently, I do not think that there are any API manufacturers of um, antibiotics on, on, in sub-Saharan Africa, at least not established uh, companies. But I, I may be wrong here. Maybe someone can, can shout at me. Um, but but that's, that's another example. And when we start yeah. to look also into the space of, of mm-hmm. academia, academia has been a, a, another big area that's seen a lot of uptake. Um, even if we look at things like um, investment, Last year alone, there was about yes. 134 uh, billion dollars were invested into um, biotechs and biopharma, and there's also been a major shift in the space towards infectious disease, uh, in just in terms of volume. The cancers still obviously make up the the biggest in terms of value, um, but I mean we're looking at 
one example was um, in May last year, Acadia had partnered with Vanderbilt University um, for in, in uh, specifically looking at drug targets for M1 receptor in CNS disorders, and that yeah. was a five hundred and twenty-five million dollar deal. So okay, the, uh, as, oh, uh, sorry, so, so, no, on. that's fine. <laughs> so, so that's on the R and D side, right? So we are really looking at the last mile side. But maybe you can comment um, because I know you 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 want to go off to meeting. So there's a question here about harmonization, and uh, you were talking about regulators. So you can have the best regulators in the world but they're all of them locked up in their own countries, right? So you're still mm -hmm. going to have a regional movement of, of uh, uh, substandards. So, so there's, I mean, two weeks ago, we were talking about the African Medicines Agency. So uh, maybe you can comment on that. How do you see harmonization? Uh, is it regional, that is? Uh, because Retabile talked about national harmonization of, of the regular the institutional frameworks. But how do you see, if at all, uh, regional harmonization helping in combating SFs? I think it, it's, it's another complex area. And um, as was mentioned before, um, we do have the, the issue of political will and sovereignty. And the third issue, uh, mostly related to um, the operational side, is funding where does the money come from who receives the funding uh, i think that will be an, another complex issue to to look at but we can use examples of the ich we can use examples of the ema where it's it's a combination of both public and private you need to involve both sides of of the of the of the coin because that's where it needs to be valuable for the manufacturers and the suppliers as well as for for the patient um, because that's that that's how the the market has grown over the years, what we are seeing a lot more of now is the speed of approvals and the speed of, of clinical trials. Yeah, um, and, and with the speed of approvals, uh, then hopefully that lessens uh, the chances of counterfeits because, um, and that's one of the issues I'd hoped some regulators will come talk about because <laughs> if you delay approvals, you also increase the chances of people wanting these products. I mean, we've seen that with the COVID vaccine. That already there is a lot of um, you know saline uh, water for injection floating around because people are just feeling like you know I'm going to go out there and, and protect myself. But but thanks a lot, um, Randall. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Matoe in Zambia, um, you would like to comment and maybe you know give us a perspective from there. And then I might ask one or two of the pharmacists, um, uh, you know, working in places because one of the things that strikes me in in south africa i don't know in in uganda or zambia i have never gone to a pharmacy in south africa and they on the door they have a message about counterfeits you know i've been to other countries where every pharmacy is required to have uh, a poster that that talks about counterfeits Maybe, uh, david you can make a comment from kenya and then um ziada are uh, pharmacies because pharmacies are the front line for you know for uh, counterfeits? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think this kind of approach in terms of addressing the challenge of counterfeits, we know it happens. We know counterfeits are a problem to us. But the question that we need to ask ourselves as players within the industry as well that what happens is you find we say there's counterfeits and we need to address the challenge with counterfeits. But the very people, the very pharmacists and the pharmaceutical professionals are the ones dealing in them in their premises. So who is dealing with them when we're saying the impact that they have to the public? Probably, let's say, for example, in Kenya, we operate. My mom doesn't know about medicine. She was a teacher, and she's a retired teacher at that point. So she wouldn't understand what the difference between counterfeits and non-counterfeits and the original products, the quality ones. But if at all the people within the industry are not doing what needs to be done to curb the aspect of counterfeits, then that's not going to work. Then another challenge that I'm, I've, I've had as well being mentioned at this point, which is a very critical bit, ensuring that we have regulations that are meeting these needs. And that is an important thing because for any control of regulation and control of counterfeit substandard and falsified medicines in the, in the markets, whichever country you are, it is upon implementation of regulations. So some, the regulations are not there as much. And in some contexts, the regulations are there on paper, but they're not being enforced. 
So the other thing would be looking at how do we enforce them. And I love the aspect where we had contribution from the pharmaceutical society of Uganda, where we were looking at what the society does, especially around ensuring that counterfeits are involved, are being controlled and regulated in the market. So it's a matter of engaging with the industry and engaging with the professionals to do that. And I think those would be better approaches for my perspective. Thank you so much, Katerina. Yeah, so thank you very much. And the interesting thing is sometimes we think it's an African problem, actually, but I know that in the UK, um, there was a, a famous case of products that came through from Italy, and then along the way, they were swapped over or something like that. Um, uh, we have a UK pharmacist here, uh, Prof. Chinyanganya, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, what's the situation of monitoring uh counterfeits in the UK. And um, Wendy, maybe you can also comment after that. I know that on the US-Mexico border, there are lots of things that happen there. <laughs> so it's, it's not just marijuana or cocaine coming across, but there's also the issue of, you know, count, counterfeit products along such um, uh, long lines. Uh, Prof. Yeah, um, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, in UK and uh, also in Europe, under the European um, uh, regulatory uh, condition, uh, counterfeits can be detected at the dispensing stage in pharmacies. Each pharmacy now has um, a device, uh, a scanner, which uh, when you are dispensing before the product actually goes out, uh, the barcode is scanned and counterfeits can be detected at that level. Um, and it's a requirement. Unfortunately, with uh, UK exiting uh, the European Union, uh, that is not being enforced anymore, but it's still being enforced in the UK. In, uh, in Europe, I mean. So, yeah, we can detect counterfeits at, um, at pharmacy levels on dispensing. Okay, that, that's a very interesting uh, system. But you're assuming that the product that is, so, so some counterfeiters, actually they put a lot of effort into the packaging itself, right? Um, yeah. so, so you're assuming that, and I guess 90% of the time that's the case that the product that is in the package is the original product. But I mean, you can yeah, be clever. Also, and, also, also, also yeah. the packaging has changed. Before, you could have um, a medicine packaged in a, in a, in a little box and um, there was no temper to seal. But now, all boxes have got a perforation, not just um, a seal. So you can tell if a, a box has been tampered with. So part of the process of scanning is telling whether the, the package has been tampered with at all or not. So all these are all in the new packaging uh, regulations. Uh, either there's a temper, temper proof seal or um, the box is perforated. Okay, so that's very interesting. What about in mm -hmm. teaching in teaching healthcare workers? I think that there was that um, case as well. When you teach healthcare workers, whether they are nurses, doctors, pharmacists, is this an issue that you actually talk about? Yes, uh, people who are working uh, with medicines, um, either supplying to the public or to to patients are actually having to go through um, it's called the falsified, falsified medicine directive FMD they are having to learn uh, and sign up to that and be accredited that they have learned and understood the, the falsified medicine directive so yes it's uh, part of the training of all health workers now that's interesting because maybe uh, that might solve all the issues that uh, Retabile kind of brought together, this uh, fragmentation. Um, right. Uh, Wendy, would you like to comment on the U.S. situation? 
Well, I don't really know much about the situation for pharmaceutical drugs, but I think you're correct to say that the large majority of fake or adulterated products are imports and they don't get caught. Uh, there was a case of, of uh, adulterated heparin uh, fairly recently, and there is inadequate awareness because there's an assumption that the regulatory scheme is sufficient to catch them. Uh, for uh, dietary supplements, uh, vitamins, herbal supplements, and uh, foods also, there's a fair amount of domestic adulteration, and there is not in my opinion, anywhere near adequate punishment for the people who put this stuff out. So it continues to happen. And I think that there have been reasons why people do not want to crack down on it. The public is completely unaware that drugs might be adulterated, but they are told in the media constantly that they should expect all herbal supplements to be adulterated. And if there was a swift and severe punishment for the adulterators, it would be difficult to keep claiming that. Oh yeah, okay. And then it might lead to hesitancy to, to use medicines. Um, so you, you, you work a lot in the herbal space. And um, what about COVID though? Have, been, have there been cases of uh, COVID vaccine uh, being uh, counterfeits, uh, uh, substandards yes. in yes, the US? I, yeah. I, I've heard of both at least one case of fake COVID vaccine and also uh, efforts by armed men to steal <laughs> shipments of real COVID vaccine. No, that's interesting. And and you've been vaccinated now? Uh, I have had one shot of one of the mRNA vaccines. I get my other shot next week. So yeah, I've been fortunate relatively. Yeah. And uptake has generally been good. It's geographically patchy. Unfortunately, I, I don't know to what extent people follow American politics, but it's very divisive right now. And um, and there's the, the, the right wing, basically, whatever left wingers believe, including that the sun rises in the east, they automatically reject. So, so the there are conservative um, media people who are very influential telling people that the vaccine is harmful and COVID is no big deal and they shouldn't take the vaccine. Yeah, I think it's that that's pretty much everywhere. But when we look at what's happening in India, then yeah, we worry a lot. Um, right, thank you very much for that contribution. Um, so, I don't know if there's uh, anybody who wants to comment some more, uh, and then we will have closing remarks. Uh, Namibia, South Africa, anybody who wants to comment more on this uh, topic? Hello, David. Eric here. Yes, yes. I hope you can you can see me. So I uh, we can I, hear you. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks. This is a very interesting discussion. So I had uh, two comments in the, a few, a few comments, but I'll just uh, amplify maybe one or two. The first one is, um, so on, on just uh, um, um, for what people think in terms of regional integration, if at, um, if at national level, we seem to be fragmented like that, and there's a reason for that. And for government, it's mainly because of mandates. Yeah? As long as we still have those things called mandates by ministries and departments, we'll still have fragmentation. <laughs> um, it's, it's just how government works. Otherwise, if you, you might be left with no job at all, then they fuse you with someone else. So I think that's the biggest problem that we we have so it's just a question of fit for purpose, uh, you know, systems and uh, um, and and administrative uh, structures. Um, the, but the other question I had was on the issue of 
in in the continent we have seen an increase in the on on, on traditional medicine especially some remedies on addressing COVID because there was no treatment. Has anyone looked at some of those products and um, that are being that are being um, put out there to the users uh, who can be patients or they can be <laughs> or, or or otherwise? How they they sort of not fit for purpose products? Uh, either in terms of quality or packaging or things like that. Because increasingly, as you have quasi-government institutions and state universities getting involved in commercialization of products, you have a big hand of government which weakens the regulator. So you might be told, I want this approved by tomorrow. <laughs> and then you, you get into trouble. So. Is anyone have some any look at that? Um, thanks. Um, uh, so, so uh, what you tend to find, and there's there's some work that uh, I was involved with, would be contaminants. So you know, you get heavy metals. Like right now, everybody's talking about cannabis, for instance. But um, quite a lot of that cannabis or hemp or cannabis could be contaminated with heavy metals, especially in South Africa because we do we are a mining country um also things like aflatoxins uh, could contaminate uh, s such products so the i think the the general handling of of those products usually is not as it should be um so i, I mean it's something that uh, one it's it's still worth looking at and i know that you you're sitting on a pile of money for researchers so the young researchers can contact you and, and do that kind of work but uh yes i think it's it's a focal area that so any kind of me, medicinal products uh, what we didn't talk about which is a bigger thing and maybe ziada in closing you can comment on that uh is me medical devices so things like syringes uh, can be fake. Yesterday, there was an item on the news, I think from Indonesia, where a company was recycling these um, uh, nasal, uh, I don't know what they call them, but these things that they use for s sampling, for taking COVID samples. Uh, and then they were collecting whatever was thrown away. And then they were formally, you know, wa just washing it and reusing it. Uh, so there, there are a lot of those kind of uh, shenanigans going on, and and medical devices, for instance, uh, are, are quite a problem. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else want to comment on that, and then we will close? All right. Well, thank you very much for this afternoon. So what I will do is I'll give uh, our speakers. Oh, hello. I have a question, though. Sorry, yes. my, I was couldn't hear me. Sorry yeah. about that. Go ahead. I wanted to hear from, in case anyone from the different countries you have, I would love to hear more about um, the system, the national systems that are being put forth by the, by the national regulatory authorities with um, respect to pharmacovigilance, boosting the national pharmacovigilance capacity for their healthcare systems. Right now in Uganda, we recently had an annual pharmacovigilance stakeholders round table whereby uh, you know, different stakeholders are talking about how can we really strengthen um, these systems within the healthcare system. And there's already an act which was already published whereby the local technical representatives are being um, expected to set up pharmacovigilance systems that over time they can be in a position to report on issues such as um, uh, uh, periodic safety update reports about the medications that they're importing or individual case uh, uh, safety updates about the uh, medicines they're importing. But this hasn't been implemented for now. I think it's coming close to five years because that act was um, approved in 2014. So I'm just keen on if other... Um, uh, countries we have here today, we, are, we have a representation of quite a number of countries. How have uh, different healthcare service providers, and this time with key focus on either the, the local technical representatives or marketing authorization holders, are there systems in place to actually you know, increase on their mandate 
to you know um okay. uh, develop yeah. their so, pharmacopoeia yeah so i hear you i think what we should do is have a separate workshop because we certainly you know everybody keeps saying yeah we're going to put up pharmacovigilance because of the vaccine and all of that but again it's got to do with political will and resources so my suggestion is you know uh let's get you to to facilitate such a session we we bring pharmacovigilance people i know that uh one of my good friends dr clinton Rambanapas is here, so we we can reach out to industry and and bring together a panel and also then have regulators on board. But that's a that's a very important yep, uh, topic. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, but in closing, uh, let's get your remarks and then I'll get to the other people. In closing, are we safe or are we not safe? No, we're not yet. <laughs> <laughs> From where we stand in Uganda, I, I believe there's a lot more that needs to be done, but it's all geared around increasing on our stakeholder collaboration. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Margaret, your closing remarks? Yes, well, I think um, generally governments have been focusing on illicit drugs and even based on our conversation, it was mainly on the counterfeits and fakes, but I think we also need to sort of shift our focus or rather focus more on the substandard. I think it's something that's happening quietly, but it does have a negative impact on our health. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's why uh, WHO actually talks about SF substandard and falsified because they are just as, as dangerous. Um, yeah, but thank you very much uh, for your contribution from Zimbabwe. And uh, Retabile, our plenary speaker, any closing remarks from you? Um, I think um, reg um, regional collaboration um, is something that needs to be looked at um, as far as regulating um, the movement of counterfeit medicines. We, um, especially in the SADC region, um, the SADC region can do more. There are great examples like the ECOWAS um, and other regions globally. Okay, that's good. But then you seem to suggest that uh, national integration should be strengthened first before you even go regional. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that session. So we will then meet again in, in two weeks um, as I uh, shared with you the program. And then of course, feel free to suggest topics, you know, because we are just fighting on such a broad front and we need to constantly be, uh, you know, educating each other so that you know, um, we actually strengthen systems in Africa for to improve access to good, safe products, whether they are herbal, whether they are food products. We haven't even started talking about food safety <laughs> and, and, and all of that. And of course, whether they are medicinal. And that the next meeting is going to be, so we have another emerging researcher uh, Paida from Namibia, who is going to, to be involved with uh, that, telling us about marama beans, something I've never heard of. Um, and then we have uh, Rosanna from Finland, who's going to, to talk to us in that same session about work that they've done on amaranthas um, across three continent, uh, two continents, three countries, two continents. And then we will have Marcus Frolish. Uh, who until recently was working for Pillar Africa, talking about that old crop cassava, but saying or uh, discussing how cassava can become uh, one of the most important uh, crops in, um, uh, you know, modern life. All right, so I would like to thank you for that. Um, um, we will upload, so Karen, don't worry, we will upload this uh, version again online as we normally do. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you.